Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to everyone here on this windy day. Uh, looks like uh, the, the worst may be behind us. I'm not sure. Uh, for those of you that may be unfamiliar, the restrooms are the ladies' restroom is to the left. The gentlemen's restroom is to the right. Uh, do we have any announcements today? Pam. Nobody's raising their hand. <laughs> Nobody's cleaning them. Well, thank you to whoever provided all of the tablecloths and the napkins and everything. Appreciate that. Any other announcements? So Monday's coming, um, and one of the things that we're going to try this year is we're going to have a small informal time after service, um, a small group kind of looking at scripture, looking at poetry, and just reflecting on what the Spirit is doing in our lives during Lent. Now, coming with that will be soup, and I need people to make soup and who would be willing to help clean up. Um, so I have a sign-up. It's on a yellow piece of paper, and I'm going to put it on the table in the back. So that's what that is. Um, so we'll share soup. We'll talk about scripture. We'll talk about what the Spirit is doing in our lives um, is the goal for each week of Lent after service. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, this morning, it's a minute for mission. Uh, in our committee, we have now combined everything, mission, outreach, social justice, and evangelism under the same umbrella, and Pam and I are sharing those duties. So in speaking to um, evangelism this morning, the first thing I think of, uh, positive or negative, is TV evangelists, mega churches that Saturday morning knock on the door when I think of evangelism and my I was thinking what can I do as a Presbyterian because I don't seem I'm not comfortable with that and so I um, decided I was going to look up and um, what do Presbyterians believe about evangelism so I went to that definitive source Google and and you know what they do I did find an article it was from an earlier issue of Presbyterians today and that was the title of it what do Presbyterians believe about evangelism and then in a subtitle it was reluctant evangelists telling the good news may not come easy but it's an essential part of a Christian life cycle lifestyle it's by uh, Sharon K George who is an education consultant for South America for the PCUSA um, worldwide mission and I'm going to pick a few things that I thought um, spoke to me that how I can be an evangelist. Um, God's holistic or total mission activity includes three essential areas, all pr high priorities, evangelism, compassionate service, which would be our outreach, and social justice. Each is a distinct and necessary part of God's mission and to the Christian's lifestyle. So evangelism is one part of God's mission. And mission uh, translates from the Greek for sending and evangelism for good news. So it's sending mission and evangelism go hand in hand that way. Uh, our lives speak louder than our words. And of the first Bible, many people will read. The attitudes of respect, compassion, and humility should characterize our evangelism and all other participation in God's mission. While words are necessary at some point in evangelism, our deeds, attitudes, and lifestyle help or hinder evangelism. So if we look at our version is lifestyle evangelism, it's a matter of speaking, inviting, and receiving. We learn to speak about our Christian faith to others, to share what difference the presence of God and the support of the Christian community make in our lives, especially in times of suffering and transition. We tell others of the spiritual resources and guidance that we find through prayer, Bible study, church, and service. Many people around us are searching and hurting. We can invite people to attend a Bible study, a support group appropriate to their need, or church service. While not all will accept an invitation, we'll find that people are more spiritually hungry and open to receive them than we may be to extend them. Most people go to a church initially because they're invited. 
and many are simply waiting to receive an invitation. When people respond to our invitations or come to our churches on their own initiative, we must receive them in Jesus' name and, and way. From the moment visitors enter the church property, their ease in navigating the facilities, the way they are greeted, the understandability of the service, the relevance of the message, the response of people to them after the service, and follow-up calls, letters, or visits is a positive or a negative witness to the gospel. Uh, in figuring, finding the lifestyle, I never thought of a Presbyterian. I could never think of a Presbyterian evangelist that I saw on TV until thinking about the lifestyle. And then I think of Fred Rogers. At, he lived every one of these things. He demonstrated every one of these things. Just and he was on TV. Never wasn't considered an evangelist in in my term in what I would my definition. So the final goal of all of our mission should be. God's reign of love, peace, and justice. Okay, well, we're going to, it worked so good last time, we're going to sing again today. And this goes right in with what Jan was talking about, because we're going to sing about having the joy of Jesus down in our hearts. So everyone that's comfortable, please stand. We're going to do three verses. We're going to stop in between each one, and I'm going to tell you what the next verse is going to be. So sing it out. You don't have to be on key. If you got joy in your heart, you can be off pitch. So it's fine. Just build it out. still standing, we'll um, begin our call to worship. We come, those who seek to trust in God, commit ourselves to do as Jesus would do for those around us. We come delighting in all the wonders of wonders God provides for us. We would not worry, but open ourselves to God's heart. We come waiting patiently for God to speak. We will be still listening for God's words of hope and of peace.
are told how simple life with God can be. Trust, do good to others, take delight in the wonders God provides for us. But we simply have trouble living such a life. Let us confess the struggles we have as we bring our prayers to God. In this season of light, we often find ourselves wandering the shadows of our own sin. In this time, when we focus on Jesus' ministry of healing, we hold tight to all those emotions, hatred, fear, worry, which continue to damage us. Forgive us, resurrecting God, for trusting in promises which are short-lived, rather than in your word, which endures forever. You have sent Jesus before us so that as we follow him, we might travel from fear and doubt to resurrection of life. Amen. Take delight in the good news, dear friends. Salvation is from our God, who restores us to new life. God chooses to be gracious. God loves, longs to give us our heart's desires. God provides healing and hope to all. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 3 through 11 and verse 15. That can be found on your, in pages 41 and 42 in, in your pew Bible. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you, a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt." Make haste and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. And there I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him.
Our gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38, and you can find that on page 59 in your pew Bibles if you're reading along. This picks up from where we left last week. It continues the sermon on a level place. So we hear Jesus speaking from the onset of today's scripture. But I say to you that listen... Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray with me as we meditate on the word together today. Loving God, we hear the word with new ears today, your living word. May the meditations of all of our hearts as we seek to center ourselves on your word be peaceable and blessed by you. 
our God and our Redeemer. Amen. The golden rule. It seems so easy and so familiar, doesn't it? We all learned it in elementary school or from our very youngest years. Do unto others as you would do to yourself. And I feel like every language and every culture has some version or rendition of this golden rule. Treat others the way that you would like to be treated. So that we hear the words that are familiar with new ears today to see where the spirit is leading us. So let's recap a little. We, we enter today's scripture back into the sermon on a level place. Now remembering that this is intentionally written in, the, in Luke's gospel to remind us that this is a sermon that is trying to uproot everything that is common to the society in this historical place and time and turn it on its head, focused on incorporating what God's grace does to change our lives. And so saying that this sermon happened on a level place immediately gets us to think about changing and uprooting and being different from society's standards. Ronald Allen, professor of preaching and gospels at Letters Christian Theological Seminary, writes this. In the ancient world, many groups believed that the community was to imitate its leader. So the community in the Lucan gospel is to be merciful, just as God is merciful. Mercy is releasing people and circumstances from the criminalization they deserve. Mercy is one of God's primary qualities. The world deserves punishment, but God is merciful by offering the possibility of turning away from disobedience and towards the realm. He continues to write that three things happen when the community acts on the directives of modeling God's mercy. The first is that the witnessing community extends the mercy of God and the hope of being part of God's realm to those who otherwise live destructive lives. Second, those who extend mercy find that their experience of mercy deepens as part of their gift of mercy. And third, the church models the promise of God's realm for other communities who might not have experienced that before. So the world that we experience in Luke's gospel is fraught with conflict, with people who, um, who, tur- who, who are in constant battling, And that's why you see these vignettes of if someone hits you, give them the other cheek. You see this world that's in chaos. And yet, I think the modern church can understand a world that's set on conflict, anger, and frustration. Just this weekend, we continue to watch modern Protestant churches divide over opinions and disagreements on various topics. We see our own churches separate themselves based on opinions and disagreements. And we see many communities that we once loved start to shatter based on whether they agree with one another. Yet when we participate, for example, today and every time that we worship together, when we share the peace of Christ, with one another, a symbol, whether a handshake, a hug, a peace sign. Um, We are actually claiming for ourselves a radical notion not to be taken lightly. We are saying that we participate in God's ongoing mercy and God's peace giving. How do we allow this to go from beyond around these tables and in this church and into this world? a world fraught with constant pain, constant violence? How do we show up and be seen? And how do we share God's mercy and God's light amidst all of that chaos? And what about the pain? What about when it's so real that it feels unforgivable? 
And what is forgiveness? True forgiveness. It's a question we're asked of ourselves when we look at these scriptures right next to each other because we get in the Old Testament reading the story of Joseph who was thrown into the pit by his family. And yet in today's scripture, we see Joseph inviting those who perpetrated pain upon him, deep pain, pain that had reverberations for for so long and God's mercy still claims Joseph saying no come closer to me the power of this story of Joseph is not just in the forgiveness but Joseph's language I am your brother lest you forgot you put me in the pit but I'm still your brother that's who I am come closer to me when we choose to hate and throw people who are our siblings in Christ into pits, we are the wrongdoers. And God, all through scripture, shows up on the side of the oppressed, the broken. Despite all the pains and burdens, it's important to remember that whether we agree with another person or not, they are still chosen by God. They are still our siblings in faith. We belong to each other. We are each other's beloved. Or at least we're called to live in that way. When Joseph opens his arms to his family who abused him, that's powerful. But I want to take a moment here to say that this passage is not about allowing abusers to get away with behavior that harms you. Too often this passage has been used to forgive pain inflicted in domestic situations, in violent situations. And I don't believe that that's what this passage is about. I think it's about opening yourself to be free from a prison that traps you in hatred and to step away from those that perpetuate pain upon you. Desmond Tutu writes that to forgive is not to be altruistic. It's a process that does not exclude anger. This emotion is part of being human. You should never hate yourselves for disliking people who do terrible things to you. The depth of your love is shown by the extent of your anger. Tutu writes, when I talk of forgiveness, I mean the belief that you can come out the other side a better person. A better person than one who is consumed and surrounded by anger and hatred. Remaining locked in that state keeps you in a state of victimhood, makes you dependent on the perpetrator. If you can find it in yourself to forgive, then you are no longer chained to the person inflicting the pain. You can move on and in some way help that perpetrator to become a better person too. When we look back at the gospel, we see this interesting passage at the end. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. What is Luke talking about there? Here's what Luke is talking about. In the marketplaces in this time, when you would get your grain, they would press it down. If they assumed a culture of abundance, they would press it into the bag that you held on your lap so that it's completely in there, and they would continue pouring, and the grain would spill out. That's what God's mercy is in our lives. It's an abundance pouring into our lives, and then there's more in our laps to share. God does not condone when we live in lives of brokenness and sin, but God sends Jesus the only one who is worthy of condemning us. And Jesus dies for us, for the forgiveness of all of us, before we deserve it, before we do anything to claim it for ourselves. 
Jesus says, we are his beloved. And in Jesus saying that to us, we can say that to one another. It's time to dismantle the systems that bind us to hate anyone and point our eyes toward the mercy of God, the mercy that goes beyond understanding. Until everyone has bags that are pressed down of mercy so that mercy is spilling out. Until no one has to fear turning their cheek because violence is no more. We can build a new world by remembering to treat one another as we treat ourselves. By remembering to extend the mercy that we have received. By trying in the goodness and the simplicity and the hope of our lives to extend the mercy we've been freely given and to make the world new again. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He was born to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. In him we have seen your glory. Baptized by John in the Jordan, he lived for you, spoke your truth, showed your love, and gave himself for others. In his death on the cross, he overcame death. Rising from the tomb, he raised us to eternal life by water and the Spirit. You may be seated. So this is the portion of our gathering, our time together, when we invite um, all of you to share any concerns or prayers that you would like to lift. Um, We we offer both a time to share both prayers of concern that you'd like to share or prayers of thanksgiving and joy. And then the way we do it together is we'll pray collectively um, as a group. I'll lead that prayer. We have a microphone. So if you all will join me um, in prayer. Gracious, listening, loving God, we come before you as a community each week to 
lift the concerns and the joys that are on our hearts. We give you so much gratitude for the journeys of our loved ones who are making it through illness, returning home. And we pray for those who are just beginning their journey with illness. We pray for those who are right in the middle of a long journey of illness. We pray for your presence with doctors, nurses, hospital staffs, every person who encounters those we love who are sick, that you would give them the wisdom and the compassion to know exactly what is needed. We pray for those who are lonely, for those who do not feel they have a friend in the world. We pray for those who are in cycles of violence. We pray for safety for them. We pray for anywhere in the world that is struggling, either by natural disaster or the plague of violence enacted by human beings. We pray for your intervention where your intervention and protection is needed most. We give you thanks for the opportunity to gather today and we pray that we would continue to learn about you as we love one another. We thank you for your abundant grace and your effervescent presence in our lives. Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in this service where we're invited to reflect on how we might give back of what God has blessed us with in our lives. I now call us to the time of offering. You pour out grace upon us, loving God, not so we might be filled, but that we might empty ourselves for others. Take these gifts we offer in these moments and use them to bring new life and hope to all around us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
actions go forward in peace, trusting that golden rule, which we all know from being a kid, to love others as you would love yourself because we've experienced that love from God first. And as you go, may you know that you are always accompanied by the love of God, the grace and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the compassion and the companionship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.